Hi all, welcome to the webinar. Today's topic for the webinar is demystifying AAC. I am Hari and I handle the marketing at Avaaz. This is an interactive session and you can ask us questions using the chat interface on the GoMeeting Go to Meeting panel. We'll respond to the questions at the end of the session. You can also tweet us. You can also tweet us at our uh, uh, handle Avaaz app using the hashtag Avaaz webinar. We would be monitoring our Twitter feed and would reach out to you as soon as we can. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Ajit, who would be delivering the session. Ajit is the CEO of Avas and a TED speaker. Over to you, Ajit. So um, let me introduce myself. My name is Ajit um, and I'm the creator of Avas app. Um, also, we're going to be recording this webinar so that you can share this with your friends and colleagues um, after we're done. Uh, if you have any questions, um, you should be able to see uh, you, you should be able to see a box where you can enter your questions, and I'll be happy to answer those questions uh, at the end of um, at the end of the presentation. Yeah, so I, I'm not going to be talking too much about about our app. Uh, I'm going to be talking about AAC and demystifying it. So so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so why why does AAC need demystification, right? Um, well, pretty much all of the published research over the last several decades has really reinforced the fact that AAC is incredibly helpful to children with complex communication needs. But in my own experience, and, and I'm sure this is the experience of most of you here, um, there are just too many cases where it, it doesn't work. You know, I, either the kid never gets the AAC tool and they don't get started using it, or they start it, but then they quickly abandon it, or they outgrow it, or um, you know, you, you introduce the AAC um, with the intention of aiding speech, but you soon find out that the problem is really something else. And um, the bottom line is that we aren't able to achieve anywhere close to 100% success in AAC intervention, regardless of what AAC technology we use, what app we use, and all of that stuff. Um, the situation is even more confusing, you know, if, if, you, if you go out there to the internet and you try to find out what people are saying about why AAC is not working and what you should be doing to make it work and what the best practices are, you know, you, you, you find yourself in a minefield of jargon, really. Um, and what really confounds this whole space is that, you know, for a few decades now, uh, a lot of conversation has been steered by what technology is available. And so we have we have met many different people who, who have, you know, different kinds of AAC systems. And each of these um, vendors really has built the system on slightly different sets of foundational principles. And um, so I, I think we're one of those rare professions where there are so many different sets of best practices. And all of them work somewhat, but none of them is really a silver bullet. And, um, you know, I, I, I've often wondered, is that just the nature of the beast in some sense? Is it just that um, there are so many different interpretations and approaches to AAC? Is that something we can't avoid? I mean, we've heard, um, all of us have heard, you know, you know people say, um, you see one kid with autism, you've seen just one kid with autism. Um, you know, I think um, a lot of therapists say, well, maybe it's just that, just because every kid is so different, there are so many different techniques and strategies around AAC. Um, well, I, I partly agree with that sentiment, but but I think that you know the field is also very scientific. It's very rigorous, and there are a bunch of core fundamentals that, that we can all agree on in terms of what kids with complex communication needs require and what AAC technology should provide. And if we understand those core fundamentals and we look at you know commercial offerings in the light of those fundamentals. Um, we are able to evaluate those options much more confidently and scientifically. So that's the topic of today's webinar, demystifying AAC. We're going to be popping buzzwords in today's webinar, you know, core words, pragmatics, uh, motor automaticity, fluency, um, agent language, you know, all of these words. We're going to be trying to build this overall model of how kids with special needs use AAC, and we're going to see how all of these terms really fit into that model. And hopefully that will, that will empower us to make better decisions about AAC and remove some of the voodoo, um, you know, uh, around some parts of it. So let's do it. Let's let's demystify um, AAC, right? Uh, so this is an outline of today's talk. Um, 
I'm going to be starting with some basics. What 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 is speech? What's language? What's communication? Um, are, are these shades of the same thing, or are they different? Um, what does each word mean? And 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 most importantly, what do we expect from AAC along these three different dimensions? Um, then we're going to be talking about a few um, concepts that surround communication as a social activity. We're going to be hearing the word pragmatics. Um, used frequently in, in, in this section of the webinar. So what does pragmatics really mean? Um, as we talk about pragmatics, we're going to segue a little bit into a discussion of language. Uh, we'll, we'll take some fairly obvious concepts like the word, the sentence, things like that. And we'll tease out AAC ideas from that. We talk about core words, we talk about peripheral words, uh, we talk about how phrases and sentences are formed. Um, after we do that, um, we'll talk a little bit about why, you know, designing an AAC system is so tied up, is so tied in with designing an AAC strategy. And uh, we're going to be discussing aided language input, which uh, is the number one AAC strategy that I know. Um, you know, in that context, we're going to be talking about this question of learnability of AAC. We're going to, we're going to investigate what makes an AAC system learnable by a kid and um, specifically going to touch upon a few a few ideas regarding color and multisensory coding. Um, then we talk about growth, AAC systems that grow with a kid. Um, and um, finally, um, also about fluency and, and, and how to achieve it. And at the very end, I'm going to wrap up with a few tips based on my experience um, on implementing AAC systems. So before we start um, into the meat of the matter, uh, one disclaimer. There are a few facets of AAC that I won't have time to talk about today, um, just because you know that they, they, they're such big topics in themselves. Um, so I'm not going to be talking about AAC for adults. I'm not going to be talking about text-based AAC systems or, or AAC for literacy. So today's talk is primarily going to be about picture-based AAC systems and mostly about AAC systems for kids. Okay, so so this is where we start. Um, speech, language, and communication. So the roots for this um, this slide actually came to me in the Isaac conference um, in in 2014 in Lisbon, uh, where uh, we were exhibiting and, and I was participating in that conference. And we had this research symposium after that. Um, you know, some of the top brains of AAC. Um, you know, we, we got together and we discussed AAC research, AAC technology, all that good stuff. And uh, a number of us felt that you know. Kids with special needs often have these three different distinct needs, speech, language, and communication. But even those of us who work with these kids regularly, we, we, we're often not very sure what these three terms mean, you know, and that's the foundation of AAC, really. Um, so let, let's quickly go over this. Um, what's speech, right? So speech is the everyday term um, that we use to refer to what's more technically known as articulation. Um, in other words, it's the process of physically expressing a sequence of sounds and uh, when this sequence of sounds hits the ear, by the process of hearing, it serves to convey a message. So it's, it's a physical process. You know, it involves the muscles of, of the respiratory system, the vocal tract. In the case of people who, who have these speech generating devices, then you know, the speech generating device produces that physical expression. It's a, it's a physical expression. That's the critical bit. Um, what about language, right? So language is, um, you know, it's, it, it's got many definitions, but the definition that I like the most is it's shared meaning. It's, a, it's an agreed upon system, you know, it's an agreed upon set of symbols that allows people to interact and communicate with each other. I think the core property of language is that it's symbolic, right? I mean, we give uh, names to things, we give names to, to, to objects around us, to actions around us, so that we can talk about that with each other. Now these names are very arbitrary. You know, we, we call something a door. The, the actual object, um, door, has no relation to the word that that represents. Right? And that's why in, in, in every different language it's actually called a different thing. Um, but language is, is, is a bunch of words and it's a bunch of ways of putting these words together to create meaning. And um, it's very powerful because it's combinational. You know, even if you have a very limited vocabulary, you can put those words together in infinite in an infinite variety of ways. And what about communication? Right? Communication is a medium of interaction between people that uh, allows us to direct the emotions and the actions of others. 
So we communicate to convey information, right? We communicate to get people to do things for us, to express approval, disapproval, express our needs, our wants. I think we communicate so that we're able to live socially, and, and all creatures that live socially have to communicate in, in, in some form or the other. So these three different things are very closely related, but they are very different. Um, and when we understand the distinction between these, uh, we can start beginning to figure out what exactly we need to help a kid with and what technologies can help with that. So keep these words you know, in mind as we, as we step through this webinar. I'll be coming back to this again and again and again. Right? <clears throat> what do we expect from AAC? I, I think this is the most important question in all of AAC. Right? What, what do we expect from all of these picture boards and apps and you know, um, devices and all of that stuff? Um, you'd be surprised at how diverse the answers can get. You know, in my experience, I've had people tell me, um, I, I want my kid to use AAC because I want my kid to start talking. Or uh, I, I even had this, this person tell me, I, I want my kid to use AAC because it will make her more intelligent. So obviously we have to do a lot of demystifying to parents about AAC, but are we even clear ourselves about what AAC um, is supposed to do? I think, so this is what I think, right? I, I think the primary goal of AAC is to facilitate communication. Yeah, uh, that 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 communication eventually creates inclusion and creates mainstreaming. Um, if we can find ways of providing some kind of technology intervention, it could be no tech, be low tech or high tech. But if we can if we can give some kind of intervention to kids with complex communication needs that helps them achieve their goals of social communication, then that's the key to making their lives normal um, in some sense. Now, what does that mean? So first of all, I, I think it means that AAC has to facilitate this whole repertoire of social interaction. So it should include all kinds of, you know, making comments and greetings and asking questions, answering them, you know, joking, uh, kidding around, agreeing, disagreeing, all, all of that stuff. Uh, this is called the pragmatic range of communication, right? So, so many AAC researchers believe that widening that breadth is much more important than you know teaching 20 ways of requesting an object. Um, but um, you know, so, so I, I think that the AAC vocabulary should give access to that whole range of, of communication. Uh, the second point is that AAC should facilitate what's called autonomy, right? So we don't let the choice of the app or the choice of our um, vocabulary uh, limit what the child can say. Um, you know, in, instead, we we kind of allow the kid to be able to use AAC to say exactly what they mean. So this is called autonomy, right? It's, it's independence of control. So the child controls what they're talking about. The child is in the driver's seat. Um, I, I, I think a, a point that I, I'd like to make here is that this is very different from, you know, independence of operation. I'm talking about independence of control. We want the kid to be in control. But we don't necessarily insist that the child has to use AAC independently. Of course, it's, it's great to have that, but often um, just because of the level of disability, we may need the communication partner to help as well. Um, the consequence of, of, of insisting upon speaker autonomy is that any AAC system has to encourage what's called snug, spontaneous novel utterance generation. So this means that you know the kid should be able to say something completely autonomously that they have you know they they they, they would want to say it but they may have never actually said it before. Um, so the kid has to learn different language patterns and generalize from them you know instead of just memorizing and repeating stock phrases. So there's not a single AAC system today that's successful that you know that just provides a whole bunch of sentences that a kid can pick from because that doesn't facilitate snug. Uh, it doesn't facilitate autonomy. So these are the three things. Um, let's let's um, so so we want AAC to facilitate communication, right? And, I mean that's the uh, so C in AAC stands for communication. Uh, but that's easier said than done. And let me let me walk you through this. So uh, here's a random conversation that I that I overheard earlier today, right? Uh, so this this sounds pretty typical, right? Um, you, you can look at it. Um, but let's put this under the microscope. And what's interesting about this conversation, this is between two guys, and what's interesting about this conversation, or, or any other conversation for that matter, is that each of these sentences actually has a purpose, right? Each of these has a purpose in this conversation. So when you say, you know, hey, what's up? 
Um, what we're really engaging in is a, a, a greeting or a conversation starter. So this doesn't really serve a, a, a functional purpose from a meaning perspective. Um, it's just performing that social task of opening up a conversation. And it's called a speech act. Um, or, or technically it's called a static communication. Uh, so the next high is also the same thing. It's a, it's a static communication. Um, next you have an expression of opinion. That sandwich looks yummy. So that's relating to the point of view of the speaker. I mean, the speaker has a point of view and that point of view is being related to the other person. And then the other person agrees. And then that, that person adds, you know, I just made it, which is relating information. Um, and then you have, you know, cool, which is just another static, you know, expression. It doesn't really indicate it. This lubricates the conversation. Um, and then you have a question. And this is a yes, no question. And uh, you have agreement. You have a request, which is, you know, can you, can you make one for me, please? Um, and no cheese is expressing a, a preference. And I'm dieting is, again, relating information. So this is really interesting because it tells us that for two people to have this natural, easygoing conversation, there are so many types of sentences that we need to communicate. Um, here's another example. Um, I, I actually overheard this, this conversation in a flight uh, recently. Uh, I found it really funny. Um, but yeah, moving along. Um, so in the context of AAC, pragmatics are labels that we give to sentences in, 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 uh, in conversations, you know, which, which indicate and their social function. And all of the terms that we saw in the last two slides are examples of pragmatics. So, patting, you know, asking a question, indicating preference, making a suggestion. All of these are pragmatic labels, right? And uh, it's important to, 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 to separate pragmatics from grammar, in some sense, or syntax. Because when you say, you know, could you make me a sandwich, it's a request and it's not a question. Uh, because it has exactly the same pragmatic function as please make me a sandwich. Right? Even though it, it, it ends with a question mark, um, it's, 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 it's a different kind of pragmatic. So I put down some of the most important pragmatics on this page. So many, many pragmatics. And as we grow older, we acquire new ones, and we, 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 we get nuances of the, of the basic ones and so on. But here's the thing, right? When we're trying to teach a child with complex communication needs how to communicate, and if they have language or cognitive impairment, for example, if they have autism, we sometimes need to first teach them what the social functions of communication are. So we may teach them that when they want something, they should request someone for it. Or if they feel strongly about something, they should express an opinion about it. The thing is, you know, research indicates that it's much, much easier for kids to understand and to learn this cause-effect relationship right, between social function and the sentences that indicate that social function, if they can somehow be given an insight into which specific pragmatic they're using. So that's why organizing vocabulary pragmatically is so helpful for kids you know, who are trying to learn to communicate. It, it allows us to teach them a direct correlation between a particular intent and a particular communication pattern. So pattern, right? Pattern is the key word here. So when we use sentences in English, um, we 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 have patterns in those sentences as well, and you know we use those patterns as patterns to decode meaning. But these patterns are typically quite complicated. For example, if I say, "Could you make me a sandwich?" Uh, it's really a question, and I'm using this word "could," uh, but I don't really mean "could." You know, I, I don't really mean "could" in the sense of past tense of "can." I'm just being polite. Um, but what I'm asking for is a request. So it's it's a little hard to parse a sentence like this if you don't already know um, English really well. And not surprisingly, a, a child with autism would struggle to make the connection between a sentence like that and the desire to ask for something. But on the other hand, if they're taught that whenever they feel the desire to ask for something and they have a consistent pattern for it in their communication chart or in their app, then they pick that up so much faster. So here's an example. Um, of how the request for object pragmatic is patterned in Avaaz. Uh, this is the new version of Avaaz, which is, which is coming out really soon. It's called Avaaz Every Day. Um, and I'm going to be showing you a few examples of, of vocabulary from that. Um, and, and you can see that this, this is a, there's a basic pattern whenever kids want something, right? So they say want, and then they tap something in, in food or things. Or they tap more, and they tap something in, in one of those things. So it's, it's consistent, very consistent. It's one way to do it. So here's a more complicated example. 
um, let's say uh, somebody wants to ask a question, right? So this is what the kid would learn. The kid would learn, okay, pick something from the top row, and then pick an action, and pick something from the top row again, and then pick something from under questions. So for example, supposing, you know, uh, you, supposing the child wanted to say, uh, supposing you wanted to say, you know, did you see mommy today? He wanted to ask that question, you know, did you, did you see mommy today? So the child would learn, for example, that you is under people, and mommy is under people, and C is under actions, and um, so they, they would go, you know, you, C, mommy, and then they would go to questions and they would, they would select yes or no. So really what they're saying is, you see mommy, yes or no? And that's not perfect English, but it's perfect pragmatics, right? Because you can, you can now extend this. So for example, you can say, if you wanted to say, you know, you can say, you see mommy where? And that, that would be the equivalent to saying, you know, where did you see mommy? And so on. So skills finds is really reassuring. Right? They're learning a pattern here, which they're reusing again and again. But you know, instead of instead of having to learn all of the rules of grammar, they have to learn maybe 20 patterns. And um, that, then they become really broad communicators. They, you know, very quickly they're able to create a very broad spectrum of, of the kinds of sentences that they're trying to that, 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 that they're able to say. Um, you know, here, here for example is um, is the share a secret pragmatic, right? So the kid goes into the top row and then they go into actions and then they go, go back into the top row and then they go into this, this thing called my sentences and they say it's a secret. So for example, uh, you can say, uh, you know, uh, I ate a cookie today, it's a secret, right? So they're able to code a pragmatic with this vocabulary which would otherwise take them two or three fairly complicated sentences to create. And that's why they're able to do it much earlier, right? So it's quite interesting because, you know, you're probably saying to yourself, you know, hey, hey this is not really English. Um, you know, if, if I wanted to say, did you see your mommy? Uh, you wouldn't say, you know, you see mommy, yes or no. Um, and I agree, in fact, you know, it, it isn't really English. It's a, it's a different language. That's the way that we should look at it. Uh, you remember that original slide we had about language, speech, and communication? You know, language is coded meaning. It's, it's a pattern that joins words in, in all of these infinite combinations. And the whole idea of language is the ability to make so many different meanings with so few words, and that's what makes it so magical. And that's exactly what pragmatic you know, organization of vocabulary does as well. With a very small vocabulary, kids can communicate across so many different pragmatic situations. So we, we spoke about pragmatics, right? And, and you know, when kids start communicating pragmatically, it's quite important. Uh, they often don't understand the meaning of specific words that they're activating, right? So for example, you know, they may say more chips if they want to ask more chips. And obviously they, they know what chips means, but if you ask them what, what does more mean, uh, they may not know the meaning of that word. They may only know that word in, in the context of that pattern. You know, and is that good? Uh, is, that, is that a good thing? Because that's a major debate that, that happens within the AAC world. You know, if, if, if the kids learn these patterns without learning the words, um, as it were, they're still communicating. In fact, they're communicating a lot, much, much earlier than, you know, if they had to learn the words before the patterns. And they are, in fact, imitating the way in which, you know, typically developing kids pick up language as well. Because typically you, you, you don't always understand the individual words until much later. Um, you know, you're, you're mimicking what you see your parents do and stuff like that. But the charge that's leveled against uh, many systems that are purely pragmatic based, right? For example, systems like Ford and things like that, is that children don't find it very easy to make the switch back into English uh, once they've developed some communication repertoire. So these kids are able to, you know, they're able to get to a certain point and then um, the the at least what some therapists think is that by emphasizing pragmatics, they lose out on further language development. So here's where the code words movement is really big, right? So this is a seminal paper that uh, Banaji published in 2003, and she found that 96.3% of every utterance that a toddler makes comes from a group of 23 words. That's pretty amazing, 96%, right? That's enormous. And if you look at these, you know, of course, if you look at these utterances, if, if, if you were actually recording all of the utterances that the toddler makes, 
Uh, you'd find that they'd be combining these 23 words in, in so many different pragmatics, right? They don't learn these words individually. I mean, no kid knows, for example, what's the meaning of, you know, mine uh, in isolation. Um, they only know how to associate it with a certain pragmatic. But it's also undeniable that, you know, having learned these words, they're much better placed, you know, as they build more vocabulary to construct more complicated sentences and build pragmatics. So a lot of AAC systems are focused uh, instead of instead of focusing on pragmatics, they focused on making the four words accessible. I think you know PRC is, is is one name that comes comes to mind immediately. But you know, speaking for myself, I, I actually don't think that this is a great idea. Um, you know, communication comes first. I, I think that's the first most important thing. Communication comes first. So the child already has a lot of language. Uh, then it's perfectly fine to do core words. It's probably the right right choice. But for a kid who has communication difficulties, there's absolutely no point in being able to know how to say the first 20 or 100 or 200 words without being able to use them in conversation, right? And that's why without pragmatic patterns, it's going to be really hard to do that. So I think that the right approach is actually, you know, to do both. So if you can have a vocabulary organization in which all the pragmatics have clear patterns, but those patterns are actually patterns of core words, right? In that way, the kid gets to hear the core words, they get to recognize them, they get to make sentences with them. And when it comes to learning these words in isolation, they're able to do that so much better. And just as a, you know, and just, just as a trivia in some sense, uh, I want to point out that all of these top 25 core words that technology has in the paper, um, in, in Abba's, for example, there in it's not just these 25, you know, top 100 core words, for example, are all available with one tap or two taps. And so they're all there and they're all being used, um, you know, all the time. So, um, you know, it's, it's just they're being integrated into, into pragmatic patterns. So kids are learning all of these words, but not at the expense of um, learning to communicate. So they're learning language and they're learning communication simultaneously. Okay, um, the next thing to understand is that the design of AAC system is inextricably linked. You know, it, it's completely un, inseparable from you know, the way in which the, the AAC system is really implemented. So in some sense, the strategy of AAC implementation and the design of the AAC app are completely connected to each other. Right? So what's the right strategy? So if we're going to talk about designing AAC, um, we're going to have to start asking what the right strategy is. And, and you know, this is a question which wouldn't have had a very clear answer if you asked me a few years ago. But now I think in the light of recent research, we know exactly what the most important factor is that governs AAC adoption and communication development. And that's continuous usage, right? So we don't mean usage by the child alone. We mean usage by the parent, the teacher, the caregiver. And we mean that these people communicate with the child using AAC. So that the child learns to use the app by mimicking what the caregiver is doing. So that's called aided language input, right? And why is that? Um, you know, so, so let me ask you a question. Supposing um, you wanted to learn Chinese, and I'm trying to teach you. Would you learn faster if I spoke to you in Chinese, or would you learn faster if I spoke to you in English? Obviously, you would learn faster if I spoke to you in the language that you wanted to learn. Right? So communicating with a child verbally and expect, expecting them to communicate back non-verbally, it's like talking to, talking to a kid in English and expecting them to become fluent in Chinese. I mean, it's, it's, it's just not going to happen, right? And that's why we call this principle uh, aided language input, which is now being widely regarded as the single most important AAC intervention technique. Don't just teach the child how to use AAC. Use it yourself and rely on the child's cognitive skills to imitate you. Right? And that's, that's the thing about AAC, um, that's the thing about ALI, right? aided language input. Um, it needs to go outside the therapy room and into the real world. It's not, it's not enough um, if, it's, if it's the therapist communicating with the child using AAC. I mean, a therapist spend one hour a week with a kid. That's way too little stimulus for the child to learn language and communication. On the other hand, if a parent, you know, if, if a child's parents and teachers and therapists and siblings and friends and everyone is using AAC to communicate, uh, we have a much better chance of stimulating the child's language development and bringing it on par with a typically developing child, right? 
I mean, I, I met um, I met Jane Farrell, who's one of the world's top AAC experts a few months back. And she, she told me something very interesting. She said, if you expect a child to develop you know, expressive capabilities by using an AAC app once a week, you know, or 15 minutes a day, it'll take them 80 years to become a mainstream communicator. I mean, the only chance we have of making a child with complex communication needs fluent in language and communication is if we ex extend AAC use um, beyond therapy sessions, beyond the classroom. And um, that's 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 really the biggest you know, biggest design feature that that we can have in mind when you're building an AAC system. You know, AAC intervention originates in therapy therapy session, but it really um, it it has to be something that a, that a teacher or a parent can use in the in their child's daily life as well. So um, so so the next thing to understand is that you know um, you know if 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 that's what we're going to be doing. Um, so, so how how does the how does that affect the design of our AAC system, right? So this is the aided language input template in some sense. You have the caregiver learning how to use AAC, and you have the caregiver using AAC when talking to the kid, and then the kid picks up um, how to use AAC, um, and then the kid actually starts using AAC. Now, you know this this is a template of of how the kid actually how ALI helps a child develop communication. And, and you can see very clearly that the, the leap of faith uh, over here is really step number three. When a, when a caregiver is using AAC when talking to the kid, how can we make, make sure that the child is actually understanding what's going on? And how can we make sure the child is actually picking up how to use AAC? Um, this particular process um, of a child being able to understand what's going on is what I call learnability, right? I, I think uh, it's the ability of the child to be able to learn by watching what the caregiver is doing. Now, this is actually a topic that has not really been investigated very much in the research. So I don't want to, you know, I, I'm not an expert on this. Um, and I, I don't think that anyone is. But there are a couple of things that people have tried and which have worked. Um, you know, the, the idea is again to reinforce. The idea is to make your AAC app um, easy enough for the child to understand that they are able to mimic what the caregiver is doing. The first thing is using what's called these communication temptations. So a communication temptation works something like this. What you do is um, you would artificially set up a temptation for the child. You probably hold their favorite food, for example, in front of them but you wouldn't give it to them unless they actually ask you for it using AAC. So when you have a temptation like this, what it does is that it establishes very clearly the cause and effect. So the kid is able to make that very clear um, connection between the intent, which is that they want that particular food, and uh, the, the action, which is that they're saying, they're making a request pragmatic in, in their AAC app, and they're getting that. So that's 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 one of the key things that um, that that facilitates learnability, and the second thing is this whole multi-sensory input. Now, when I showed you all of those patterns, um, you know, odds are that we were all of us were looking at it very one-dimensionally. We were thinking of it as you know specific cells that we want we we had to click and and that, that results in a pattern. Actually, in an AAC system, it's not just one dimension. When you press something, it speaks it out. So um, there is there is audio involved. There's a picture which um, which each of those things is associated with, and there's a, so there's a picture involved. There's the location involved. So this pattern, which is actually a pattern of words in our heads, when it actually plays out in AAC, it's it's many different patterns of many different things. It's a pattern of positions. It's a pattern of pictures. It's a pattern of sounds. All of that. So that's what's called multi-sensory input, right? And if we're able to provide this multi-sensory input in, in conjunction with this whole cause and effect, we're able to, we're able to make a very strong case for learnability. Um, the kid is very likely to be able to latch on to something and to be able to make that connection between either a motor pattern or a picture pattern or something like that and the desire to communicate a specific pragmatic. 
Um, let's let's talk about one specific aspect of multisensory input in a, in a little more detail, right? So let's let's talk about color coding. Um, so this is uh, schematically how AWAS, you know, the AWAS vocabulary looks. I'm I'm using this as an example. Um, let me just change the colors a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So this, this is uh, schematically how, how the ABAS everyday vocabulary looks, right? So you have pink, uh, which is which is used for sentences and for phatic communication. And then you have yellow for people, and you have um, orange, which is for, um, you know, for things, and you have green, which is for actions, you have blue, which is for descriptors. And, you know, that, that sounds familiar to you, that's because it's the fifth general key. And you know you probably have other AAC material that are coded in this special key, and the child will be able to carry those connections across different materials um, as well. So um, um, that's 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 the way that color coding is done. But here's another dimension, right? So if if you looked at this and you and you just and you just made this into a schematic and you, you zoom it out and look at it, um, that's what it looks like, right? It's got these very clear delineated areas of different colors. And if you had to overlay this with, for example, pragmatic patterns, you see a very clear connection between them. So it's not just colors, it's also spatial. You know, a child is able to correlate different parts of the screen with different parts of a pattern. And we think that's a big boost to the learnability of the vocabulary. Okay, um, there's one other thing that I hear all the time from professional educators and therapists, and that's you know, how do I get my kids to move from, you know, the level of vocabulary that they are at now to the next level of vocabulary without losing everything that they've learned. So typically AAC vendors ship out vocabulary in grades and you know a grade corresponds to a specific level of development or a specific age or something like that. And obviously the level of development keeps in increasing and age keeps obviously um, you know <laughs> no one gets younger. Um, so every grade you know vocabulary should really build on the previous one. Um, I think it's very important when you're evaluating vocabulary for a child to not just evaluate what the level of vocabulary is that matches their capabilities right now, but evaluate upstream as well, you know, and, and what the next level of vocabulary is going to be like and, and the level after that and so on. And if you find that, you know, an AAC system has a gradation of vocabulary that requires you to start from scratch every time you move from one level to the other, that's a bad idea, because when you go through that, you know, you, you have to you have to go through that tough. You have to go through a stage where uh, you are actually losing communication capability before regaining it, and regaining extra capability, and that completely kills the communication intent. And uh, during that switchover period, you're probably going to have a lot of difficulties with the kid. So um, that's that's something really important to keep in mind when you're talking about gradient vocabularies. Here's an example of grading done right. You know, so this is this is the level zero vocabulary of um, of Avas every day. Um, you know, the new app uh, from the Avas family, and um, you don't you don't need to remember everything, right? I, I'm just I just want you to look at the basic shape of this, right? So now let's look at level one. So this is level zero. Let's look at level one. So you see how the regions remain exactly the same, and the shapes remain you know exactly the same. You have you have pink at the at the left and you have the the actions down the middle and you have um, you know the, that that column on top um, and, and stuff like that and this is the next level level up right level two and you can see that you know it's 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 still very similar it's only the size that changes it's not the patterns you still have the patterns that flow for example from you know the top to the actions back to the top you still have the patterns that flow from for example you know um, actions to my sentences and stuff like that. The words retain their relative locations on the screen. You just move up and down the ladder um, to a higher grade or to a lower grade, right? So this is how you design vocabulary that grows with a child. So I'll show you that once again. So this is the this is the level zero. This is the level one. And that's the level two. And you can see that the the, the shape is very similar. The the shapes are very similar. Um, it's just the number of words have increased substantially and the number of the complexity of words has also increased substantially. Okay, I have just one more thing to mention and that's this whole idea of fluency. So there are, you know, so th this is 
This is actually a question which was a no-brainer um, maybe 10 years back, but you know it, it, it's it's not it's not that it's it's not that obvious anymore. The thing is, there are a lot of developmental conditions uh, for which AAC is being used, um, and so it's not only being used for non-verbal kids now. So it used to be that AAC was very unequivocally an assistive technology, right? It, it was something that um, was very permanent uh, in terms of how, how a child would use it. it. It was as permanent as a hearing aid or a pair of spectacles or something like that. But now AAC is being increasingly used as an educational tool. So it's being used for kids um, who are verbal um, as a way to get them to develop literacy, for example, or you know, for, for, for them to be able to develop educational um, and developmental goals. So for kids for whom it's used this way, uh, it's actually very important to track vocabulary, language complexity, literary my, literacy milestones and stuff like that over a period of time. So the question really comes up of, you know, do we really need the kid to be fluent in AAC if, if they're not going to be using it, you know, throughout their life? So I, I actually think that whatever the goals are, the ability to build up speed within the app is something that tremendously boosts its ability to work as a communication technology. So I think fluency is really important. Um, you know, so and, and and fluency is not about speed, right? We're not just talking about the child being able to get faster and faster at using the app. We're also talking about what's called cognitive availability. So if you've been typing on a keyboard, and I'm sure all of you have uh, for any length of time, you'll find that your brain doesn't come in the way um, of, I mean, your, your you know, the, the process of searching for keys on the keyboard, the process of selecting the keys on the keyboard, you know, that, that requires your brain, but it doesn't come in the way of your higher level thoughts, uh, you know, as, as, you, as you search for the keys to press. In, in other words, there are automatic pathways in the brain that handle word selection and word articulation without disturbing the part of the brain that deals with thought. That's what we call fluency, right? It's the ability to think and communicate at the same time. Now, you know, the, the jury is still out um, on, on what are the different ways in which the brain can develop fluency, but there's one thing that we know uh, which works um, really well across different um, environments, and that's called motor automaticity, right? So motor automaticity is where the brain is able to automatically convert words into muscle movements or, or muscle instructions uh, more accurately without higher cognitive functions coming in the way. So motor automaticity is what moves your mouth when you're talking, you know, moves your fingers when you're typing and stuff like that. And that's a really um, important, you know, interesting way to get uh, fluency in, in, in these in AAC systems. So, you know, how do you actually get motor automaticity in AAC systems? You know, there's a lot of mystique about motor automaticity in AAC. And, uh, but I, I think one takeaway that I'd love you to have at the end of today's webinar is that it's actually very simple. Um, you know, there's just one rule, and um, you know, it's it's this is the rule, right? If you want your AAC system to facilitate motor automaticity, in other words, if you want an AAC system which a child becomes faster and faster at using, and you know, they're able to use it less and less with less and less effort uh, with practice, then what you need to do is you need to make sure that every word has a fixed location on the grid forever. Right? So every word should have a unique position in the vocabulary and that unique position should never change. So it doesn't matter how many taps it has or how, much, um, how many you know, levels of depth you have to go to, all of that is immaterial. Right? It's, it's, it, if, you, if you have a way by which a position of a word is invariant, it's guaranteed that as you use it more and more, you will become faster and faster at using it. You know, I, I think it's important to debunk this myth that you know certain AAC systems are better than others at motor automaticity. That's not true. Almost every AAC system can be configured to facilitate motor automaticity. It's just got this one principle, right? Don't rearrange words that the kid has learned, and to the extent possible, don't repeat words. Just have one path for one word, and have one position that you don't change. Right? So now you know. Okay, so we're, we're really nearly at the end of today's webinar, but I just want to close out with a couple of really important points. Um, in AAC, I think, you know, we, we tend to think that the magic is in the app, the magic is in the, in the, uh, 
AAC tool itself. You know, it's not. Um, all of you know that it's it's not. The magic is in the intervention, right? I mean, we we've, we've been Avaaz has been in the in the market now for for six years, and I've seen people who've used Avaaz and who've had great results, fantastic results, and I've seen people who haven't um, had those kind of results. And the only thing that's different between the two is how they've used it. Right? So it's all about the strategy. It's all about the implementation. So I've already told you what the number one most important strategy for AAC adoption is, and that's aided language input. So make sure you're fluent in the AAC system, and make sure you keep using it in front of the child. Right? So here are a couple of other tips. So first of all, uh, make sure that you, you use AAC everywhere. Right? So there are opportunities for communicating really in every single waking moment of our lives. And it's important to ensure that kids have the ability to access that universal, um, you know, universal opportunity for communication. The only problem is that you may be worried about dragging around an iPad, you know, in, into the bath or when the kid is playing soccer or, or whatever it is, right? So that's why we always recommend having a low-tech equivalent of the same vocabulary. Um, yeah, and that should be handy wherever you go. If the technology is either not allowed or not appropriate or it's just not working. <clears throat> the second thing is that, you know, I think this is important. Um, AAC is a means towards an end, right? And the end is not developing capability in AAC. The end is communication. Sometimes kids will have ways of communicating even if they're not using an AAC app. They may use gestures. They may use facial expressions. They may use signs. Uh, they may use all kinds of other, um, you know, other ways of communicating, and that's good. That's all of that is really good because, you know, if, if they're able to keep communicating, then that's the goal that we've been aiming for, right? We've already achieved uh, what we set out to do, which is to get them to communicate. And that brings us to the end of this webinar too. So, um, with all of this, all of these ideas about AAC, I hope you understood a little bit about what the what the jargon means. And I hope you, you've learned something about strategies as well. So keep communicating and make every voice heard. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, thanks, thanks, Ajay. Thanks for the informative uh, presentation. Uh, Ajit, we have a couple of uh, questions here. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Happy to yeah. answer any question. Sure. Uh, we have a question from Kelly. Kelly asks us, uh, what's the best way to get buy-in for aided language from teachers and paraprofessionals? Very interesting question. Very interesting question, Kelly. Um, uh, I, I've, I've had this so many times from... Um, Um, so I found this to be the single best way of doing it. Um, the single best way of getting that buy-in is to concentrate on um, we were looking we were working with this one kid and his 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 mom uh, was completely uh, new to AAC and and she she was frankly she was a bit overwhelmed when we told her that she would have to learn this and she'd have to communicate and all that. So we told her, look, don't don't worry, it's not a big deal. First, just concentrate on learning words and learning AAC um, in the context of meal time, right? So just use AAC during meal time. So every day, during breakfast, during lunch, during dinner, um, try to use the AAC app to be able to say something about the food. So ask questions, make comments, um, agree, disagree, make jokes, everything but only in the context of meal times. So you only have to learn maybe 20 words to be able to do that. I think the ability to provide that easy slope, uh, to be able to provide the thin edge of the wedge, so to speak, uh, is really quite important to be able to get buy-in from um, educators and paraprofessionals. Uh, once they're able to get the idea of it, very quickly they start seeing the results, and once they see the results, the results are their own reinforcement. So that's the way that I would, I would address that problem. Okay. Uh, Ajit, we have one question from Evelyn. Uh, yeah. Evelyn asks us, uh, 
what people know need to know about uh, aided language stimulation is that this is the technique to employ with AIC users at the earliest levels of language development. Once the user is adapted combining two to three words of more and gaining competence in navigating their displays, less ALS is better to encourage more independence. In other words, ALS needs to be employed with an appropriate prompting hierarchy. So what are uh, your thoughts on this, Ajay? I completely agree with you, Tim. I, I think um, it's a it's a very valid point to make. But having said that, um, I think I, I think I should also point out that the very large majority of AAC abandonment that I've seen happens in the first maybe six months, um, well before the child reaches the stage of being able to make two word, three word sentences. I agree that. Um, we need to make sure that there is a, a prompt hierarchy so that when we're modeling, we're also encouraging the child to, to be able to make sentences themselves. It's not only one way. And um, the prompt hierarchy itself is well established. So we know exactly what the sequence of prompting is. Um, but I think that if, you know, it's a, it's a champagne problem, right? It's a problem that we would love to have, that the kid is grabbing the device and the kid is trying to communicate um, instead of um, the, the the parent or the caregiver needing to do that. I think um, the the challenge is really to be able to get to that point. And um, if if we're able to get there, then mostly the effect stays, and we're able to we're able to coast on on its own steam. Um, and and aided language stimulation seems to be you know, an absolute winner in, in in being able to get the kid to be able to communicate at that level uh, within a, a, a few months. Thank you. That was a great question. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Finally. In fact, we have one more uh, uh, note from Evelyn. Evelyn says uh, uh, that the definition of speech given in the beginning of the presentation was too simplistic. And uh, speech is more than physical expression. It, it's also a neurological process. Uh, think of cases of apraxia of speech. The physical production of speech sounds is also tied to the coding of word meanings in memory to <coughs> develop semantics. So, yeah, in fact, I uh, I would need your thoughts on this. Okay. Um, well, I, I can give you my my I, I can give you a very brief um, reply to this, um, Evelyn. But, but perhaps you know we could take a conversation offline. Um, the the standard model which actually governs um, the production of, of language, uh, production of speech um, in, in the head of somebody, is what's called the Levelt model of word production. Uh, Levelt, spelled L-E-V-E-L-T. Um, the Levelt model of word production basically says that there are what are called underground processes that happen in the brain, which pick out the words that you want to say. So you have intent. And there are these underground processes. They're called underground because they don't require um, active thought for you to be able to, to to select words. So you have these underground processes that select these words and which 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 kind of uh, indicate what these words are. And after the words are selected, there's a separate stage uh, in which the 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 muscle patterns or the motor activation patterns for these words are generated and they're actually being spoken out. Um, I actually have some references that I could share with you, uh, but I think that the the point of level uh, model of word production is that there is a very clear separation between the point at which words are brought out from the brain and put together in, in, in various sequences and the point in which they are actually converted into articulation and spoken out. So this is a topic which obviously is, is of tremendous local interest, I mean topical interest in psycholinguistics. And uh, it's a fairly technical topic, uh, but I'd be happy to share some of these references with you, and, and we could discuss this further um, offline uh, after the webinar. Sure. Uh, thanks, thanks, Ajit. Uh, I think uh, uh, that's the end of the questions as well. So, thanks all for uh, uh, being present for the webinar, and thanks, Ajit, for the informative session. Thank you very much. Thank you for the for the very insightful questions. And um, please feel free to contact me and uh, to be able to please feel free to email me any other questions you have. We love 
um, having conversations with therapists and with, with people that work with kids with complex communication needs. And um, we hope you will join us for one of our future webinars as well. Thank you once again and signing off now. Bye. Bye, everyone.